everyone, I'm Jill Osmond and I am the assistant to the elder team here at the River Church. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97,000. That's River Connect to 97,000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the message today. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Uh, So I do know some of you. There are some familiar faces in here. Uh, My name's John Carter. I am the Flushing Location Pastor. Uh, But there is a lot of new faces here that probably don't know who I am. So I just want to give you a little bit of a background from uh, who I am, where I come from, and how it is that I came to be here. Uh, So I grew up in Japan. I was a missionary kid there for 17 years. Uh, I came to know the Lord, though, when I was an adult. And that might seem a little odd. Hey, you were a missionary kid. How come it took you so long to figure it out? Well, I'm very, very stubborn. And so the Lord had to put me through the ringer, so to speak, to to come to know him. He chased after me. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, But then I started to attend a church out in Goodrich. uh, And I was there for about nine, ten years. I worked on staff at the River Church as the director of operations. Uh, And then the Lord called me down south to South Carolina. And then uh, when I was down there, I was down there for about three years. Uh, and I've met many incredible people down there. And so then the Lord called me back as a flushing location came up. Josh called me. He's like, hey, uh, we have this opportunity. Maybe you'll repent and come back. You know, he's always hassling me about the fact that I left. Uh, but he's like, hey, why don't you come back? We've got this opportunity. Would you, would you pray about it? And so the, the Lord obviously opened those doors. And so I became the location pastor at Flushing. And so it's kind of cool. Uh, we've been walking through uh, a series, uh, Be the Church. Right? And it's kind of what we've been walking through. So uh, I'm a little, I just want you to know, I had a cup of that coffee back there. Man, I am amped right now. I feel it in my bones, right? Like, so if I move around a lot, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just that great coffee that I had back there. So I, this is probably cup number three. So that probably doesn't help any, any either. But anyways, we're, we're in the series called uh, Be the Church. And uh, we're today, as, we, as Josh explained, we're going to be walking through Reach, Gather, and grow, and today specifically on the subject of reach. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 17. Uh, As I was preparing for this message, uh, I was looking at how to really um, wrap through reach. So I've been a part of the River Church. I've heard reach, gather, and grow. You hear it twice a year. It seems like a very common thing to to ingrain in our minds. It's important that we know what our mission is, what our purpose is. Uh, But sometimes it can become redundant. Right? Like you can hear, oh man, I've heard this again. I know what this is all about. And you get into this process where it's just, just the normal. Maybe some of you here, this is the first time, and that's fantastic, so this will be fresh and new. But if you've heard the, the, the vision of the church, Reach, Gather, and Go, we, we share it at the river twice a year to make sure we're on point and we're doing what God has called us to do. Uh, but it can become redundant. And when I left uh, from, from the river and having heard it consistently, and I was down in South Carolina... Uh, I realized real quick something that was really profound for me in my own life. That Reach, Gather, Grow was not just something that was uh, an organizational goal. It had to be something that was very personal, right? It had to be something that I had to live out, whether I was in a church that talked about it all the time, or whether I was in my home in in a totally foreign, in essence, foreign place, South is different than the North. They have different culture, right? And so how do I do this, and how do I make it personal? And so today, the underlying theme that we're going to walk through, the question that I want you to really wrap your head around is is this question. Is it personal? And we're going to walk through John 17, where we get to see that Jesus and the Father, they made it personal. It was very personal for them. And so we're going to walk through aspects of reach, the gospel, uh, and what Jesus is sharing here in, uh, in John 17. This is known as the Lord's Prayer, right? Or the high priestly prayer. And this is where Jesus gets very intimate with his Father just before he approaches the cross. And so we're going to see some very, very personal aspects of what Jesus prays for. As I was looking at this word personal, I, I tend to like uh, 
looking at synonyms, words that are similar to the word personal, uh, versus antonyms, things that are completely opposite. It kind of helps give me some structure, right? Like it gives me some context of the word, how to apply it, how it, how it involves uh, in my life and how I can apply it to my life. And so I want to share a couple of the words uh, that are synonyms for personal. These, these are interesting. You write them down. You'll see them as we walk through John 17. The first thing is that came out and stuck out was the word intimate. Personal means it's intimate. So as we walk through this question, uh, first and foremost, is the gospel personal to you? Is it something that you make very intimate in your life? Is it personal? The other words that stuck out were it's special or exclusive, right? It's exclusive. I love this other part. Uh, the word personal means that, that it's claimed or it's owned. It's yours. You have ownership of it, in essence. You have claimed it as your own. It is your personal story, in essence. And we all have our own sh story of how we heard the gospel, or maybe you haven't heard the gospel, and hopefully today, by the end of the day, you will make it and claim it as your personal gospel, the good news, okay? The other thing that we see, and I like this word, and I, I was surprised to see this word as a synonym for the word personal. The word is peculiar, Peculiar. I'm like, man, how does that relate to personal? Well, you know, as soon as I heard that word and I was reading it, I was like, man, God did say something about in the scriptures to be a peculiar people for him, right? So one of the things we know right off the bat, and I, I thought this connection was pretty cool, is that God desires personal relationship with each and every one of us. He wants us to be that peculiar people for him, that personal people, that relationship. So we're going to walk through uh, John 17, before I jump in there, I want to look at the, the antonyms, the opposite of what personal looks like. And this is very easy, especially if you've heard the same message about reach, gather, and grow uh, quite frequently. It's very easy to fall into this, this category. Some of the, the antonyms for personal are is that it's commonplace. Like it's just something you would see like a tree you pass by, you just saw it, yeah, it's not a big deal, it's common. The other words that you would see is ordinary or unimportant, usual or general, right? So these are the opposite of personal. So when you start to walk through this question in your mind, is first and foremost the gospel personal? Is it just something that you have taken in general and have, have it in general, or is it very intimate? And also as we walk through the vision of the church, and this is the second part of that question, for believers to really wrap your, your mind around in the question is, is the mission that Jesus has given us, is the mission personal? Is, is, is it an intimate decision that you have made, hey, I'm going to share this great news that God has given me about his son to the people that God has, as Josh said, placed me, whether it's in the community that you work in, the community you live in, your neighbors, your family, have you made the mission that God has asked each and every one of us through Jesus, have you made it personal? It's very easy to hear the words reach, gather, grow, and associate it as an external thing that this organization follows, but have you made it personal? And so let's walk through John 17 and really see how Jesus made it personal, and then we'll see how we can apply that to our lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we jump in. Heavenly Father, man, just thank you so much for being present. Lord, I feel your spirit. You are here. And so, Lord, I'm excited to be able to share what you have laid on my heart. Lord, I just pray that you would give me clarity of speech. Help your word to touch the hearts through your spirit as you would have it be done. We love you and thank you for all that you have done, will do, and will continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so John chapter 17. Let's start in verse 1. I'm going to read a couple verses through verse 8, and I want to point some things as we go through. John chapter 1 or 17, verse 1. This is just before Jesus is going to the cross. He goes, and his prayer is re re recorded by John, the disciple, and he says this, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Verse 3, he says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, 
the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. Circle this next phrase. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory with which, uh, which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to, the, to men whom you have given me out of the world. He is, that word manifested is he has made it visible. He has made it clearly seeable. The manifestation of who the Father is is visible in the person of Jesus Christ. As he continues, he says, They were yours, you gave them to me, and, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I come from you. And they have believed that you sent me. They have believed that you sent me. Now as I walk through that passage, there's, I could spend months and months just dissecting the, the passage in John 17. But there's one particular phrase I want to kind of focus on today. In that phrase, in that verses that we read, it says, Jesus says that I have accomplished or completed the work which you gave me to do. The work that you gave me to do. And I love that earlier in that, in that passage, just before it, he says that, that all the authority, you have given him authority over all the flesh. This is very much correlated to Matthew 28 when you go back, and Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me, Right? This is, this is very much in line with what he has talked about when we talk about reach, gather, and grow. God has already given to Jesus this authority. And here as Jesus is praying this intimate prayer between him and the Father, he establishes, hey, I know I have this authority. You have given me, in essence, this power to do the things that you have accomplished or want me to accomplish. And we see this word in there just shortly after that where he says, I have finished the work which you have given to me. So immediately, my mind, I ask a lot, myself a lot of questions. I immediately go, well, what was that work? Now, immediately, we're going to say the gospel, right? Like, that's, that's, if you've been churched, that's, that's the pat, immediate response. That's not wrong. But I want to go into some other correlating passages that really establish that work and help renew and help us understand exactly what Jesus did when he accomplished that work. So that we understand when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about the work that Jesus did, when we talk about reach, we have a way to make it very personal. So if you'll jump with me to Luke chapter 24, I want to read a verse, a couple of verses from Luke 24. He says this in verse 44, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. I'm sorry, I just jumped a few lines. Uh, that I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophet and the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45, and he says, And he opened their understanding that, there might, that, that they might comprehend the Scriptures. In verse 46, he says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ, or that is the Messiah, as it is written in the Old Testament, that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. We know that suffering took place on the cross. And to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, just like Jesus, or just like Josh, uh, he is not Jesus, don't... <laughs> Just like Josh uh, was saying in the video from Acts, starting in Jerusalem, going into Judea, we see Jesus affirming this in his own statements to the disciples, that this, this message, this work which Jesus did from John 17, this is what will be preached, the repentance and remissions of sins, the suffering of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 48 says, and you are witnesses of these things, behold, I send the promise of the Father, of my Father, upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued or clothed or covered with power 
from on high. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we walk through this and we look at the work of Jesus Christ, one of the things we see real quickly is this work at the cross. What took place at the cross was, in fact, Jesus' mission for humanity. And we see this very clearly. We keep going and we look at other texts like Romans 10.9. Uh, we, we know this, if you've been a part of church, this is a very common verse that is, is shared. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God was, has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes. That's where that personal aspect comes in, right? It's easy to say with your mouth, but if it's not in your heart, is it really truly personal? Is it intimate? Or is it just generally something we say? And this is really the contrast that I really want you to work in your own mind when you think of the gospel, when you think of the work that Jesus did. Is it personal to you? Have you applied it to yourself? Have you claimed it? Have you made it an intimate relationship between you and Jesus and God the Father? As he continues in, verse, uh, in Romans 10 and verse 10, he says that we uh, will, will believe from the heart and to righteousness and with the mouth Confession is made, and this is made unto salvation. Verse 13, he says, And for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the work of Jesus Christ. This is the work that took place on the cross. As you go through and, and, and read in 1 Corinthians, there's a profound phrase that Paul uses. And I like to remind myself of this. See, we, we, we know of the free gift. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, for whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life, right? And it is a free gift. But Paul articulates this thing that you were bought or you were purchased for a price in 1 Corinthians. He says this in verse 20, for you were bought at a price. Actually, if you jump back to verse 19, it says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own. You were bought with a price. You're bought with a price. And look at what he says as he continues. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And look at what he says. And in spirit, which are God's. What is he saying there? What he's saying is, is God claimed you as his own. In other words, God made it very personal what he did on the cross. Consider this. The price that he paid was indeed his life. Now, we can often in our society say someone gives you a free gift. Our immediate response is, ah, well, it's probably not that valuable. Right? Unfortunately, that's how we, 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 we do it. You put something out and you put free, it'll sit there forever. You put like a dollar and somebody wants it because it's apparently worth more than free. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is our society. Sometimes we do this and, and we operate in this way. And so sometimes it's, it seems that the gospel can be cheapened in our own minds when we, we think it's just a free gift. But it's really important to attach this, this aspect that it was by no means cheap. The life of Jesus, the blood that he shed, was very, very, very expensive in the sense that it was his life. It's not a cheap gift. It cost him and his father something. The blood of Jesus Christ. And so oftentimes when we think of this gospel, the, the, the good news, the cross, it's easy to be immune to the cost that it took Jesus to carry our sins, to pay the price of our debt. One of the things we'll see if you jump to 1 Peter, I love this, 1 Peter chapter 17, verses 17 through, or 17 through 19, it says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, Peter then says, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. And that stay is talking about our life. Your stay here on this earth. Conduct it with fear. Verse 18, Knowing that you were not redeemed, with corruptible things, like silver or gold. From your aimless conduct received by traditions from your father, verse 19, but you were purchased, in essence, I'm linking verses uh, uh, 
uh, 1 Corinthians, you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, you've heard this story, maybe if you've been churched, that Jesus had never sinned. And that's the fact. That's what that's saying there with Peter. He was a spot, as a spotless lamb. He never sinned. So his gift to, his good news is us, a broken people, a people that have sinned, that are full of sin, we have hope in a Messiah. We have hope. And that's, Messiah is the Hebrew word for Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title. It's the Greek version of Messiah. Jesus is our Messiah. He's our hope. And the hope is that even though we are broken, even though we struggle with sin in our lives, we are, there's not a single person in here that can claim, I am sinless. There's not. Jesus, who could claim that, and we can look at Jesus' life and compare it to what the Old Testament, just as we read, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms say about him, Jesus lived a perfect life because he is God. And a perfect, sinless man who is God came down and shed his blood for me and for you. For me and for you. And that was not a cheap cost. And so sometimes we think, oh, it's just cheap, but I don't want you to think that. It was very, in essence, personal. When you really think through this, it was very personal when Jesus hung on that cross. He thought of me. And he thought of you, and he said there as he hung, it is finished, meaning he knows, he knows who we are by name and what we need from him, that our confession, right? When we confess to the Lord our sins, and we, we say, Lord, I need you. That is the power of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's another passage I want to read in Revelation I love this because this kind of gives us the future view, right, in Revelation. There's a passage in there that's really, really profound in chapter 5, verse 9. He says, and they sang a new song, saying, this is talking about the person of Jesus Christ, and we really establish the worth and the personalness of Jesus Christ. He's saying this, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on earth. As you continue, he says, that John, the, the, the writer of this, says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, here it is again, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. This is who Jesus is. He is the Lamb. He is the one that deserves all of this praise and honor and glory. And we understand that. And so when we we see what Jesus did and we, we look at what he did for us, recognizing that it was very personal, Very personal. And as I continue to read, I'm going to jump through uh, John chapter 17, go back to John 17. We're going to see Jesus start to do stuff, uh, continuing past verse 8, that makes it very, very personal. Very. So that's the work. We know Jesus' work is what he did on the cross. If you'll continue reading with me in John 17, verses 9, it says, And I pray for them. Jesus is praying for his disciples that are with him just before he's going to the cross. And I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all mine are yours, and all yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these, those are the disciples, the them that he's praying for, 
are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. The aspect of oneness there with the Father. When you understand, when you receive the gospel, the free gift, you become, in essence, the church. You are the church. The church is not this building. The church is not an organization. It's not even a denomination. I'm guilty of doing this just as much as anybody. I'll tell my wife, hey, I'm going up to the church, and it's just an empty building. It's a complete misuse of the word church because church is people. I'm going to the facility where we gather, in essence. I'm not going to church because church is where people are. And here, this aspect of oneness, the mission, the vision, the purpose of the church, Jesus is praying for that unity that should exist. And we see through Paul's letter the aspect of unity all throughout his letters. And as we continue and read John 17, he says this in verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except for the son of perdition. This is Judas Iscariot, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word. The power of God's scripture is so profound. And the world has hated them, Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I love this part. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Jesus is praying for his disciples. It would have been very easy for Jesus to say, yeah, man, let's just all go to heaven right now. And sometimes I'm like, Lord, why isn't that happening now, (laughs) right? Like, just take me now. I'm done with this. But we see Jesus praying personally, intimately, for his disciples. The vision that he has, the oneness, the beyond mission in essence. And here he says, I didn't, I'm not asking that you take them out. We know the world's going to hate the gospel. And when we talk about the world, we're talking about the flesh, our sin nature, what we as humans struggle with, this idea that God indeed is who he says he is. He's holy, he's righteous, he's powerful, he's almighty. And in our pride, we want to be dismissive of who he is. We don't want to submit to his authority in a lot of times. And this is where sin, the evil one, the world, the flesh, comes in and takes its root. As we continue in verse 16, we see this. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is why growth communities are so important, getting in the word of God, getting in and and learning what his word has to say and how we apply it. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I want you to, it's easy to just walk past that. Jesus was sent here to do a work. His work was accomplished And all authority on heaven and earth was given to him when he accomplished his task at the cross. And as we walk through Matthew 28, this aspect of reach, gather, grow, go ye into the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded. This is where we get reach, gather, and grow. Jesus here in his prayer, his personal prayer with the Father, his intimate prayer regarding the disciples, he says... Very clearly, I'm not, I don't ask that you take him out of the world that's so harsh and so difficult and sometimes very ugly and painful. He's like, I'm not asking that you take them out. But Lord, just as you sent me, I send them. And this is where we get this vision from Matthew that we are called to go after. And if you look at what Jesus says in verse 19, and for their sake, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by truth. Sanctification, this process of changing. Man, I wish when I first became a believer when I was 21 that I knew then what I knew now, right? Like how many have never said that? Like, man, I wish I knew exactly what I needed to know as soon as I became a believer. It took this process that God walked me through, this molding and this shaping 
And as we as believers, as we start to recognize the mission that God put on us to go do, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news. I love verse 20 because this is really where, in my opinion, for me, it gets real personal. It gets real personal for Jesus. Look at what he says, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, for the disciples alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. Guess what? I don't know if you've ever thought through this or even considered this. Jesus prayed for you and me. He specifically, being God, he probably knew each and every one of our names. He said, I am praying for not just these 12 disciples, but for those who will believe from their words. He prayed for me and for you, and he has the same desire for me and for you, that we will be unified. And we'll see this as he continues in verse 21, that they, that they all, every single one, may be one, that unity, be on mission, go after what God has called us to go after. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be, look at this, one in us. If Jesus has all authority in heaven and in earth, what he's saying there is we have that same access, that same power, that same, in essence, authority. So sometimes when we talk about, and I'm, I, I'm not ignorant, I grew up in the church. Even though I became a, a believer later on in life, I get it's sometimes really, really scary to share your faith. In the workplace, what if, what, what if they don't like what I have to say? What, what if they think I'm a, a Jesus freak, <laughs> right? Like these are some of the thoughts that come through your mind. I, they've come through my mind. Like how are they going to receive this? The gospel is somewhat offensive. You have to tell someone they're a sinner. Yee. That is not okay. That's not PC in essence, right? That, that's not okay. You're a sinner? Oh, man. Me too. <laughs> guess what? We're in this boat together. But guess what? There's hope, right? And this is, this is when we walk through this aspect of reach and when we talk about making it personal. Do we make this mission what Jesus has sent us, how he made it personal. He made it very personal. He gave his life for me and for you. That's a very intimate thing for someone to do. To give up his position in heaven, come down, as it says in Ephesians, as a lowly servant, as man, and to take death on. Not just any death, but death on a cross. The most torturous kind of death you can imagine. Jesus did that. He made it that personal for me and for you. And I don't know if you're here and you've ever heard the love of Jesus or the story of the love of Jesus, but that's how personal it is. He did all of that for me and for you. And I want to show you something right here towards the latter part of this prayer as we continue in verse 22. The, the finishing part of that verse says that the world may believe that you sent me. His purpose the purpose of the mission, the purpose of why Jesus did what he did and why we who believe and have repented and have asked for him to be our Lord, our master, why he did that is so that the world that he asked that we not be taken out of would see who he is to them. To see that we have made his him personal, that it's intimate. It's not just this general thing we say. Uh, it's not just something that we casually engage in conversation about. It's super personal. What he did for me is super personal. And I don't know if you've ever grabbed that and thought through that, but that's what Jesus is referencing. And look at this in verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Jesus is all about our unity, being on mission. But look at this next part. I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And, again, the re reiteration of why, and that the world may know that you, that is God the Father, has sent me. And look at this next part. This is so profound. And have loved them 
as you have loved me. Wow. Have you ever thought through that? What that's saying right there, what Jesus in his conversation with the Father, what he's trying to express and what he's trying to help us understand, and I think the reason it was recorded for us, was for us to understand that God, when he sends us on mission, when the world sees who we believe in, his power, his authority, his rule and reign, when the world sees that in our lives and when we make it personal, when it's not just a casual thing we do, but when it's intimate, like, hey, my relationship with Jesus, it's super personal. It's, rela- it's a relational thing, not a religious thing. And it's super intimate. Jesus and God claims us. Do we claim him? And when we do this, look at what it says there in that passage, that the world would know that Jesus was sent by the Father, but also, but also that the love of the Father for us is equal to the love of the Father to his Son. Have you ever thought through that? Wow. What is that saying? That's saying that God the Father loves me and you the same as his Son. Whoa. Now, I have three daughters. I don't have any sons, but I have three daughters, and I love them dearly. And and. I couldn't imagine having that same kind of love I have for them to anybody else, (laughs) right? Like if if you have kids and you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Like your kid, your own kids are really special, right? Like you can deal with all the headaches they give you, but somebody else's kid, you're like, I am not putting up with that, (laughs) right? That's kind of the approach sometimes, right? It's real. God is saying, you know what? I'll put up with you the same I put up with my own. And obviously Jesus was perfect. So there's, Jesus is dealing in essence with the adopted sons and daughters, but he is telling us here very clearly, very clearly, that he has that same love for each and every one of us like he does for his own son. That is profound. That, that is, in essence, this, this call of how personal it is. It was personal for the father. It was intimate when he sent his son to cover our sins through his blood. Jesus shed his blood for me. I just can't even imagine that kind of love that the Father would share that to me. And he's doing that for me and for you. And so when we have this mission, the mission to go into the world and share the good news that that we have received this intimate personal relationship with God, do we take that mission and make it personal? Do we take that mission and go, you know what? I know what what cost Jesus. Am I willing to take a little bit of, I don't know, uncomfortableness in sharing that with maybe my family, a coworker? I mean, what, what really am I laying down and what really am I sacrificing when I share about the goodness and the love of Jesus Christ and the Father? Is it just an uncomfortable conversation sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I, I know it's real. It's super hard. You know, you're, you're afraid of all the negative, but sometimes it's really hard to remember the, the personal approach that Jesus took for me and you. And I guess the challenge today is really this. Is it personal? Is the gospel, first and foremost, the most important thing? I hope nobody leaves here without ever knowing that Jesus, the Father, It was very personal to them. You matter, in essence, to them. And that relationship, that love that the Father has can be yours. Make it personal. Make it something that's very intimate. And to the believers, I want to challenge you, is the mission personal? Have you taken the challenge of sharing the gospel, the the call that Jesus says, I'm sending you out into the world, Have you made that personal, or is it just a general idea? Is it something that you have intimately made your own? Like, man, God's called me to do this. We are all sent in different areas. We all have different jobs. Maybe some of you work together, but we all have different locations where we work, different neighborhoods that we live in. We have different family members that we interact with. This idea of being sent out with the gospel, with the good news, that's not an accident. God's called each and every one of us, the church, us as individuals, people, 
to go do what he has asked us to do, the mission of going and reaching the lost, gathering together as the saints, and growing in his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, man, thank you so much for who you are. Lord, thank you for this intimate prayer that you have given us. Lord, that we can see how important each and every one of us are. Lord, that we can see that you and your work through the cross, you, you made it very, very personal, very intimate. Lord, you claim us. You, you desire to be ours. So today, Lord, I just pray that if there's somebody in here that doesn't know who you are, that they would claim you. They would make it personal for you or for them. Lord, I pray uh, as believers, Lord, that we would take this mission seriously. Just as you took your work seriously, Lord, that we would take the work and the, the responsibility that you have given us to go to the world and share, share your good news, that we would make that personal, that we would make it our own objective, we would claim it as our own, and we would go do that and fulfill the work and responsibilities that you've given us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for being with us, giving us the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.